Welcome to The Truth In Us Art. Thank you for tuning in to conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. I am your host, Rob Lee. Today, we embark on a journey into the vivid world of a self-taught painter whose canvases are not just reflections of brushstrokes, but resonate echoes of activism. A native of Asheville, North Carolina, he began with love and evolved into a visual provocateur, emerging street art and politics to craft narratives that demand attention and spark change. Please welcome Esteban Whiteside. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Thank you again for having me. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for making the time uh, to come on. And, uh, um, you know, before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of the, you know, your work and, 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 and that that part of the conversation, um, I want to, you know, um, peel the onion back and go to the beginning a little bit. What was one of those uh, early like art experiences for you? Some people say maybe it's their first art experience. It might be something that this is what I feel like with the first art experience. But what was that early art experience that had an impact on who you are today as an artist? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I don't know about like early art experience, but, uh, you know, back in and I would say like 2012, I was coming up here to DC um, and it was really my first time ever, you know, being inside of a museum. Um, I had never been to, I had been to like a couple small galleries uh, here and there, like in Asheville, um, but I'd never been inside like an actual museum. So um, I think the first museum we went into was National Gallery um, and my mind was just blown. Um, had never seen anything like that before and was just, you know, immediately, you know, knew that I loved, I, I knew I loved art before that. I just wasn't really exposed to it. But in that moment, I knew like, you know, I'm going to find myself in the galleries and museums a lot more. And, you know, at, at that moment, I didn't necessarily, you know, want to start painting. But I think that was kind of just the start of me, like really falling in love with art in general. Nice. Nice. Uh, ha having those those moments. Um what what was that moment when you first like did a painting like worked on a painting like intentionally like you know i go back and you know i've mentioned this on this podcast before that i've done the writing i've done the comics i've done the painting and podcasting is the thing that stuck for me so for you what was that sort of like all right this is actually me doing this this is I, I'm, I'm gonna you know put some time and energy and this is like my first painting quote unquote yeah um I think it was probably around 2013, 2014. And, you know, I wanted to get people stuff, you know, get my, I wanted to get my girlfriend uh, something. I think it was, it was like her birthday and um, I didn't have any money. And I remember just seeing like, I don't know if it was on Etsy or something. I remember seeing like a simple like Chevron design on Etsy. And I was like, you know what? I think I can do that. I, you know, I can go buy a canvas for a couple of dollars. Like, I'm just going to try it. I'll get some painter's tape, make it like, you know, uh, you know, mess up free or whatever. So <laughs> I went to Walmart. I got a little thin, super thin canvas, got the painter's tape, and it still came out pretty bad. But it was my first, you know, my first experience, like, sitting down and, like, trying to to make something nice and, you know, she ended up really liking it. I still have that. We still have the piece today. Um, but that was kind of really the the beginning, you know. Nice. And, and one of the reasons I started laughing I, I in my, in my <laughs> recording studio, I, you know, I had this this year it was probably like 2016 where I was like I had this ambitious goal for me, at least, of trying to do one painting per month for the year. And I sat <laughs> through about I think eight of them. And I'm looking at like the first one that I did. Definitely. I was using a painter's tape to keep those lines <laughs> straight. It's like, what are these triangles? It looks like, uh, it almost looks like uh stained glass a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, the, I think I saw some of your work and I, I know, I think it was the led board, the big led board in Baltimore, but also I think at Nomu Nomu and yeah. 
you know, so I want to like hear it from you because, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you can read like, you know, artist descriptions, you can read, you know, sort of what people say about the artists or like sort of the official stuff. But how would you describe what your art is about? I have some secondary questions under that, but I at least want to start there as far as the the essence. Yeah, I, I mean, just, you know, breaking it all the way down, I would say, you know, my art is about, you know, building up the oppressed voices um, in this world and and then also equally trying to shame, you know, uh, the the forces of power that are doing the oppressing. So, you know, I feel like any either, you know, any piece that I'm working on is either it's either doing one or the other. It's either trying to, you know, give the voice, give a, a voice to the oppressed or is trying to, like, call out and, you know, um, expose the oppressors in the situation. So so where where does that that come from? I mean, I have the I think I have the answer because I, I feel like we're, 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 we're skin folk here. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but where does that 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 come from? And why was that sort of like this is what I want to be like a central theme? Like it's it's a provocateur thing going on there. I, I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I always have. I've always been attracted and not attracted, but I've always like been, um, you know, kind of, I don't, I don't see my views as extreme, but you know, the, the people that I look up to, you know, I've always been like attracted to the, to the, I guess, more extreme views that uh, according to society. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I don't know. It's just like, I feel, I feel kind of helpless with a lot of the issues that are going on in the world. And, you know, I want to do more than what I'm doing right now, but where I'm at and, you know, I feel like art is, is, is what I can do in the, in, in the moment, um, you know, dealing with anything, like I can, I can make a painting, I can post it and, you know, immediately people are going to see that message and they're going to know how I feel about the situation, whether it, it does anything or not, it's more, you know, it's more therapeutic and, mm. You know, it makes me feel like I can I have a you know, I have some sort of a voice, even though not as big as I, I would like for it to be. You know, it, it's like it's something that, that I can do to not feel so helpless with all these um, situations, you know, and issues. Yeah, it, I would imagine it can feel discouraging it can feel frustrating it could uh induce anger sadness and so on and, and this desire you know I think w when there's any conversation around like activism and who gets to be an activist right that's a whole different conversation but mm -hmm. um you know there's something that that comes from it it's like what is the byproduct of it you know i've unabashedly said this podcast was born out of someone talking real ill you know former president talking real ill about baltimore it wasn't you know, about the Huns. It wasn't about the John Waters and the weirdness of it all. It was about the black folks here. Mm -hmm. That's really what that thing was. Mm -hmm. And whenever I hear those right. criticisms, I'm like, you you really mean black people, but you can't say it. Just say what you mean. You know what I mean? Yes, so exactly. That gave me sort of the the juice and the zeal to say, like, let's let's try to, you know, actually share our own stories versus having mm -hmm. someone else just do it because they're not qualified. Yeah. So Talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of that 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 moment where you you were identifying sort of what that voice was going to be. Like I see, like some of the abstract work early on, and then mm -hmm. kind of really concentrating and addressing, um, you know, the social and political issues. Like what what sparked the shift? Um, I see the tide one, which I kind of I'm kind of laughing at. I saw my dad says tired, <laughs> which makes me really laugh actually. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, definitely, you know, it's very vivid. Like, I remember when I saw Michael Brown, you know, his body laying in the street. And, you know, I remember just thinking, like, how, how hot it was and how, you know, his parents must feel seeing that. And, you know, it was at that moment where I was just kind of like, you know, I don't I, I know I don't have the 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 artistic ability that I think I should have to be doing this type of work. But, you know, I got to start talking about something instead of just trying to make something that looks good. You know, I was like, for so long, I was all about sports and, you know, it was all about, it was just all of my whole life was circled around sports. And then when college was over, you know, there was no more sports and it was kind of like, 
like what's you know like what's next and um you know art kind of filled that void and then taking that one step further it's like once i once i saw michael brown's body land in the street it was kind of like the first moment that i wasn't involved you know wasn't involved in sports and i'm in the middle of this like desert kind of trying to figure out you know what i'm about and who i am and you know, it felt to me like the first time I really like picked my head up and looked around at how people that look like me are really living, you know, um, and that's what I wanted. I decided I wanted to try to represent. That's that's it's important. It's, it's important to have, you know, that moment where you realize that you know, this is the direction I want to take this. This is how I want to go about it. This is what my part of the discourse, the conversation, the, I guess, awareness around these, these different topics. And, you know, sometimes that is the way to get it across. Like, you know, when a comedian is like, I'm going to, you know, all of this whole set's going to be about this subject matter. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, oh, we now recognize that we're talking about police brutality because now it's repackaged in a, in a different way. But it's like, yeah. this has been going on forever. We, we've been saying it like really like intentionally, like, yo, they're beating up Negroes like hotcakes. Like this is <laughs> wild. But you, you yeah. have to do it in sort of a different way that's more digested and more palatable. And um, yeah, I, I think that, that it's something about using using art as a a vehicle for, you know, having that. Like, I, I, you know, during, during this, this period in which I've been a podcaster and doing this, you know, as far as the art pod, but also I used to do a news podcast and mm -hmm. I've done it over the, I was doing it uh, starting back in 20, 2009. So we had all types of stuff covered. And it's was like, <laughs> how am I going to take this, you know, how am I going to have this perspective and be really honest about it and also have sort of like what my experience is being a six foot four black man, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I found, I found that and this was specific, you know, when this podcast started, when I had a few posts about what happened um, with George Floyd and all of that crime and that murder and all. Of, I can't believe you would say something like that. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, right. I, I, yeah. I can't be black right now. I can't have this experience right now. OK. <clears throat> yeah, and it's interesting when it's coming from from folks who kind of like what you do and like your perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you encounter any of that with sort of the the subject matter in the voice within your work where someone's like, I dig what your work is? Uh, you know, I don't know if that one, uh, that message is a little, a little aggressive there. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, um, I definitely get that a lot. Um, you know, I was approached by like a gallery not, not too long ago, you know, and they were kind of like, well, yeah, you know, the majority of your work wouldn't fit, but we see pieces kind of here and there that like, you know, would work. And I'm like, you know, like that's, that's not who I am. And like, you know, but as far as, you know, as far as like collectors or, or whatnot, you know, I feel like my work is kind of, you know, it's polarizing and it kind of weeds out a lot of those type of conversations, you know, before I even get a chance to talk to the person, like, you know, I was at an event this past weekend, um, you know, and it was, I, I could just tell that certain pieces made people uncomfortable, um, but it made me feel like I'm doing the right thing. And, and that's what I want. Like, I want, you know, I want my work to make you either feel empowered mm. and like, yeah, like somebody, somebody speaking for me, or I want you to feel like, damn, like, uh, you know, I, I'm not doing enough. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely get that, but I, de I definitely got it more from like the galleries and, you know, um, art dealers type, you know, than, than from actual collectors, I think. Do you, do you, in your experience and I, you know, I have sort of the, I feel like I'm going to do a Patreon only podcast because it's going to get <laughs> spicy sometimes, but yeah. you know, there's this sort of viewpoint on sort of what black art is, you know, it's kind of like, um, can we just attach ourselves to this person's name? Oh, I, got, mm -hmm. I got, I got, I got one of those white sides, you know, <laughs> it, it, and, yeah. 
And it's like, I don't really care about the work, but it's good to say that I have one of them. Is that <laughs> something that you've noticed or am I just, you know, off, off the mark there? Um, I mean, no, I think, uh, you know, I think there's certain pieces that like people feel like it's, it's like, I want a piece from, from, from Esteban, you know, for me and, but you know, like these pieces are like much safer mm. and those pieces tend to go, you know, quicker than the pieces that I feel super strong about. Like, I feel like every now and then I just kind of like take a break from, you know, making political work and I might just do something that feels good. And then, you know, those pieces, people are kind of more like, like, you know, like, why don't you do more of that? You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, that is, that's not who I am at all. That's just like me walking out, taking a smoke break, <laughs> you know, from what's really going on basically. So I don't go crazy. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. Um, but, but, but I've definitely, you know, like, from galleries and whatnot, like my first gallery I was represented by was in Brooklyn, uh, Richard Bieber's gallery, which I don't have a problem, you know, saying his name or whatever. But, you know, it was like he would brag about me to certain collectors and be like, yo, I got this real provocative artist and look at this, look at his work. But then when it came to Palestine and Israel and I started making work, speaking up for Palestinians, then it was like, bro, what are you doing? Like, you got to calm down. Like, are you anti-Semitic? And I'm like, homie, like, you know, you can't be like showing me off as like this artist who, you know, you're so proud of and you like, you know, he tells it like it is. And then, you know, someone comes to you and is like, I'm, this makes me uncomfortable. And then you, you're you starting to like check me and tell me what to post and what not to post. So like, you know, I've dealt with it. Definitely. That, that, that's definitely a topic, you know, that specific one, you know, um, that, you 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 say something that's not on the side that you're supposed to be on, um, or you have like your your own thought, whatever it might be. Um, it's like we have the approved um, line items, uh, talking points about this particular issue, and if it doesn't you know attach to yeah. lock up, then nah, son, you can't do that. And I, I can say this, you know, from from my vantage point, and you know, I want I got a few more questions I want to hit you with before we get to. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of last, the last few, um, okay. there, there was one where, you know, I was, you know, I don't really like to reveal who I have coming up for interviews and I try to run because <laughs> I try to be as independent as possible. You know, it, this podcast mm -hmm. isn't free, but also, you know, I, I'm very selective of who I try to do business with from a funding perspective, because I'm still doing the work. It's not free. Right. So mm -hmm. there are times where unsolicited people will hit me in the DMS wow, I don't know why you asked them this person, this question in that way. I would have asked them this. <laughs> well, you should get a microphone and start a podcast since everyone's doing yeah. it. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's always sort of this. It's people who don't look like me or you who are telling me how to mm -hmm. be a better version of what me and you are. Yeah. Yeah. That question wasn't exactly, black enough, yeah. Rob. Like, Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's one of the, it's those weird shots towards like authenticity. Um, you know, I've got the thing like I'm born and bred from Baltimore. Oh, you're not from here. It's like, all right. I, I don't, <laughs> what do you want? What do you want from me? You want to you want to see my you want to see my record? You want to see a you know credit score? What do you want? <laughs> yeah, um, no, I get that. So talk a little bit about your um sort of some of those those influences like i i see bearden i see emory douglas milton avery so talk about like you know because i think when we have influences right mm -hmm. um, we we might nip something from them and it's like i'm taking this but i'm making it my own but this is yeah. directly who the the influence is like i not steal but I, I steal. I steal from better interviewers <laughs> than me, whether it be like questions. Oh, that's a good one. Let me flip that. Or yeah. how they go about things, you know, but, sure. but like a Charlie Rose sort of move or what have you. For you, like, how do you go with some of those those references? And like, what are you maybe taking from them that you've worked into your own approach? Yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like. Like I can I can look at a painting of mine and, and, and I can like break down exactly where every influence that every you know part came from because you know i'm really heavily influenced by a lot of artists and it always changes um but early on you know my one of my first jobs up here in dc was working at the phillips collection and i remember one of the first rooms i was in was jacob lawrence um his migration series and you know like 
it was just it was just kind of like it looked it looked very simple compared to a lot of the other work that was in the Phillips to me at the time, but the message was more powerful than anything I had seen. Um, and so, you know, that hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like, you know, you don't need to be so focused on, you know, trying to make something look a certain way, like, you know, focus on the message, you know, focus on having that powerful message and, you know, having it mean something like, you know, I could draw something that looked, exactly like something or you know i could i could draw something exactly where i'm at you know and that might inspire other people who want to be artists but don't know you don't have that uh that starting point you know like i feel like basquiat was was another starting point for me just seeing his work i was kind of like wow you know like I, th- I feel like i could be an artist because i feel like i could do that and then you try to do it like basquiat and you realize he's a genius and it don't work that way but, um, you know, a lot of those those people, like even like Milton Avery, the work seemed so simple that it was like a, an entry point and like a, a starting off point for me to be like, you know, you can do this because you can do that. If you can if you can do as good as they're doing, then, you know, you figure out your own style, figure out your own messages. But aesthetically, you know, you, you know, you can, it's a starting point like you can you can move forward because. You know, so a lot of those people I was in these rooms with just guarding the art at the Phillips collection. And I was, you know, copying them as much as I could. And then eventually, you know, that transformed into me incorporating my own style into a lot of these pieces. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Wow. I like that. Um, yeah. it's, it's theft. It's gentleman theft. Let's just call it that. For sure. <laughs> For sure. I feel like everyone steals. It's just who can you know, who can put their spin on it to make it not look so, uh, not like, like you just stole it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how to say that the right way, but <laughs> you got to change something, bro. I see a lot of, I see, I see a lot of art. I see a lot of artists who like, you know, Basquiat is that starting off point for them and they do Basquiat style work, but they, they haven't like filtered it through their self and then produced it. It's just, it's straight Basquiat, you know what I'm saying? Or an attempt to be Basquiat. But, you know, I feel like you just gotta, you know, take the influence and then, you know, filter it through yourself and then whatever comes out, you know, you can kind of run with it. I like that. I I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, It's something about those 1985s. I I don't know, we're the same same group. Uh, (laughs) So being self-taught, like, you know, how do how differently do you approach your creative process now than like you know maybe a year ago maybe two years ago and you know are there any methods or routines that you've developed to kind of nurture your and refine your process um what was the first part of that again sorry Sorry. yeah here's a two-part question sorry um (laughs) first the first part is um you know as a self-taught artist like how how you uh, like um approach your creative process Mm -hmm. and how has that like changed from maybe a couple years ago to like to like now yeah um so now you know i'm still whenever i'm you know thinking about a piece or whatever like i I just keep a note book or keep paper around me all the time just to write down ideas um you know and then you know in the past i used to just go straight to canvases like raw and you know try to do something off raw motion and then you know it it never turned out exactly how i wanted it and i ended up wasting like a lot of pain and a lot of supplies you know so you know now you know having like an ipad you know i'll do the whole painting you know on the ipad you know, the color of every piece in the painting before I get into it, you know, just so I can like save supplies, save the work, you know. So my process now is really, you know, sketching first. Um, If I like the sketch, the sketch goes to the iPad, you know, I refine it on the iPad and then, you know, then to the canvas. Um, So before I was kind of just, you know, I, 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 I didn't know, like, you know, I thought like a lot of artists just kind of went straight to the canvas and did their thing. And, you know, it, it took me like wasting a lot of paint to be like, no, nah, they, they, they plan it out very carefully and <laughs> they don't do, they don't waste a, a whole, they don't waste a hundred dollars worth of paint, you know, trying to figure out what they want to do. So that's been one way I've kind of refined, you know, the practice. 
and yeah and and then also just kind of switching styles and going back from um um working on canvas to like working on wood and then also working on like sculptures i kind of like alternate through the three um and it kind of keeps me not feeling you know kind of bored with any any medium or any any kind of style that i'm doing it so so being able to kind of go between different styles different mediums that enables you to take a little bit of that that break from it to get back to it it's it's almost like when you're in the gym you're you're doing like a workout plan it's like all right i'm tired of these curls let me do this yeah. <laughs> yeah and then you know something always naturally pulls me back into the you know into the a different type of work that i'm doing like i'll you know i'll be working on camp Emphasis for a while. And I'll go see a show somewhere and see a, a really dope sculpture, and then I'm like, man, I got to get back to doing some sculptures. Like, it just kind of alternates from from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's there's service in that where you know I do this podcast most of the time, but I also have a a movie review podcast, and. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to kind of dive back into that, like it's not as it's structured, but structured in a different way than this is. So mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of like take sort of the reps in doing this and apply the sort of podcasting skills to the movie one. And the movie one requires me just to be like a movie critic and just like a person that's just diving back into and like reviewing movies and, and really taking a critical lens to it. And they they kind of serve each other because I'm not able to interview the filmmaker. So I always have questions. I was like, oh, this could be a question I could ask a filmmaker in a, in a podcast. I'm going to ask them on the truth in this art later. So they, they mm -hmm. kind of serve each other. And yeah, I, I always sure. have that notepad out as well. I mean, I got something, I got something to write on me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. All times. So I feel like I'm going to miss like the, the golden, the golden idea if I don't. <laughs> 100, 100. I even have like a pocket full of like, uh, acrylic markers and and uh like colored pencils and i never do anything with them i just like every morning got like 20 things in my pocket and then all day long i'm like man i gotta be ready and then <laughs> i usually don't use them but <laughs> i will be ready the thing that i hate is I, I have like the little one the little the little fake it's like because i'm bougie right it's either a japanese import or something german but it's a little tiny notepad with the, with the wild lines on it <laughs> and i'll like I, and, and the thing is the the paper that's really good the notepad is really good my pen game needs to improve <laughs> I, I'll, I'll i'll do it i'm scratching to try to get you know the pen like to warm up so i can actually write with it and then the idea is gone it's just, just <laughs> it's out of here and sometimes it might be you know like i said you know when i came across your stuff. Like, I think I was already following you on Instagram, but I was out and I saw like, I think I saw either, either a piece of yours at Nomu Nomu and then also the somewhere else and someone brought you up and I was like, that's three times in one day. I got to interview this dude. <laughs> that was literally what it was. And I took the note down and that's, that's kind of how it is, but definitely having, having something to capture the idea and capturing in this rawest form, like, you know, yeah. I, was, I was doing the whole Austin Cleon thing like earlier in the podcast, like sort of arc. And and I remember he had mentioned something about like editing in the digital thing, editing in like the iPhone or what have you. But he's like, I always put my initial notes on scrap paper because I mm -hmm. want to have the raw form in there. Like I might have crossed it out for a reason. But if I have the more refined version of it, my process is somehow missing in that that mm -hmm. whole like the genesis, mm -hmm. the ideas, all of that's missing yeah so i got i got two last like two real two last real questions um okay. so i read about like a, a solo show right um so talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that experience and preparing for an exhibition and sort of like that that experience yeah um well i had a solo show uh last year well two years ago at no at uh at home um in dc and then last year I had a solo show in Chicago at uh, Cherry Mountain Arts, but you know the the solo show at home it was really like my first. Um, it's kind of like my it was it was really my my first solo show that you know I've like put together over a couple of years, um, and it kind of happened because I was with Richard Beaver's Gallery. We were supposed to have a solo show the first year, uh, and then COVID hit. 
Um, and then, so that moved, that pushed that out. Um, so I had all this work and then the second year I decided to speak up on, uh, Palestine, which didn't know that was a red line. I was from, you know, from North Carolina. I didn't even know any Jewish people. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. So I was just making work freely, like, Oh, what's the problem? And, you know, he just completely stopped, uh, stop pushing the work. So I had a I had work from like really two years that I was supposed to have shows that was just sitting here in the studio. So um so I got out of my contract with Richard Beaver's gallery um right before the 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 show at home. And you know the show at home was basically like I felt like it was like a, a freedom celebration. Like I was so happy to be out of the contract and I was so happy to be showing work again in D.C. because for two years, you know, I, I didn't show anything in D.C. and I also was so restricted that I was like basically like in a conservatorship or something like Britney Spears was in. I couldn't do nothing. Um, so for two years, I just felt like handcuffed. So that show was just it was just a lot of fun. I invited everybody that, you know, all of my friends that were around here and everybody that was like, you know, when are you going to show again in DC? So it was just, it was just like a, to me, it was like a coming out party of just like, you know, being free from the gallery and being able to show exactly what I wanted to show and, and doing what I do, what I want to do from, you know, from that point on. So that show was like really special to me. Um, Cause I feel like it was like a show that was, that was supposed to happen for a couple of years. And then, and it finally did. I was I was really happy to just show some stuff. So, yeah, <laughs> that's dope. And that's a good segue into this sort of like final real question. And remember, we still got those rapid fire ones. Um, so, so throughout this this conversation, um, you know, we got some gems. I, I think you know, folks are really listening. You get some gems. Um, and so, lastly, I, I want to really be intentional about sort of the advice component. You know, here's the legit gem part, like. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give like an artist who's, you know, self-taught, who's going to say, look, I'm going to do that Esteban Whiteside thing. I'm going to do this whole thing. I'm going to make my work just like his. So, you know, they're starting out, they're self-taught or what have you, but they're using sort of their artistic expression to mm -hmm. comment on social, political and, you know, that that sort of like realm. What advice would you give them that you think is like that would serve them really well if they're, you know, really like leading with message first like art is great doing that stuff but really sticking to their guns and their message what advice would you give them um i mean my advice i guess would be you know you're gonna have to search to find your people um you know everybody's not gonna like your stuff and you know i guess you need to decide early on like do you want to do you want to make a lot of money or do you want to, you want to, you know, be about something, you know, and maybe you make money as a byproduct of that, but you know, you can't really go into it trying to do both. You know, you can't go into it being like, I want to be like Malcolm X and I also want to be, you know, super duper rich. Like you got to decide on one or the other and maybe, maybe both happen, but early on, you know, you need to make a decision because, you know, if you if you start off like, you know, all political and then you realize I like, you know, this is kind of a lonely road and like a lot of people might not like to work out as much money as these artists who are making target type art. Um, you know, like, you know, at that point, you can't like cross over and then be like, OK, I want to make this art that like everyone's loving and, you know, it, you can't do it. So I feel like, you know, early on, you need to realize like what your end goal is um, and plan to the end. And also, you know, if you want to use your work to be an activist and you want to use your work to be political, you got to uh, understand what that comes with. And it might be lots of months without selling anything. And, then, you know, it might be you might you know, you might have you might find the right person that can do a lot with your work. But you just got to be, you know, prepared to stand on what you what you believe in. And, you know, that might not be the most financially um i don't know what the word is might not be the best thing for your pockets <laughs> <laughs> no i hear you i, I think that's yeah. i think that's a really good message um and just to to dovetail as we wrap up on this this portion of the pod 
you know, from the vantage point of a podcaster. And I, and I would imagine it applies everywhere. Whatever it is, the, the thing that you do, however you go about it, you know, make that conscious effort to to do that. The, if that's what the thing is you're doing. And mm-hmm. uh, I think a lot of folks, and I was having this conversation yesterday with a friend of mine who's an artist based in New York. And we were talking about sort of some of the things we we do chasing that dollar. And I saw so many podcasters when things started to blow up. I'm going to bite off exactly what I think Joe Rogan is doing. It's like, well, you're not Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. You're, he, he like, you, do you know the secret sauce behind that? He was he was on TV for like 20 years, UFC for a long yeah. time. And it's like you, yeah. with your your podcast about paper clips. That's 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 the thing that's going <laughs> to. And it's like. If that's the thing that you do, do it. But, you know, people who are, I guess, sort of experts in the area, experts in the field, they're, they're going to be able to make that reference and really pull apart what you're doing. So do something yeah. that's reflective and intentional as it relates to who you are and what you value. That's mm-hmm. that's the thing, you know? Yeah. All righty. Let's see. I got I got four rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Uh, as I tell everybody. Don't overthink these. And it's funny because folks will get on and say, oh, rapid fire. I don't know what the questions are. I was like, are we going to make everyone? And then they're like, man, that was easy. I was like, what are we doing? Right. Here, here's the first one. Again, don't overthink them. Whatever comes to mind is what comes to mind. All right. Okay. Who is the smartest person you know? Uh, my dad. What was the last movie you watched? Um, the Reverend. Nice. Uh, if you could, <laughs> if, if you could star in a TV show, what would it be? What would it be? What would it be about? Um, if I could star in a TV show, it would be like the show How to Make It in America. <laughs> nice. But it would be me and like one of my my best artist homies, and just trying to make it. <laughs> How to make it in this with kids and everything? Yeah, trying. To make it and also like not getting started until you're like 30. So uh, look, look, man. I, <laughs> like, like I said, we are the same age. Don't get me started. I've been doing this for like 15 years. I keep getting called an overnight whatever. You remember that show, How to Make It in America? Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh well, Kid Cuddy was in it, right? Yeah, man. That show was so was so good and so dope. And like I feel like it just it kind of flew under the radar for a lot of people. And then it's it's one of those things you end up revisiting. Someone's going to reboot it, and it's like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. All right, this is the last one. Um, so this this one is going to be challenging because I, I know painters, artists, they get really caught up in this. But let's say you are limited to your three most used colors. Um, so you know which of those three colors. So name what the colors are, and which one you would remove. And what you what would you what would you replace it with? So let's say you got three colors, you're gonna mm-hmm. take one out and you're gonna replace it. So what are your three colors? What are you gonna remove? What are you gonna add? So my three colors are Carolina blue, uh, emerald green, and then brown. Uh, and then I gotta take one out and add one. Yes. Uh, then I guess I would take out the uh, emerald and I would add. Um, I would add red. Okay, I see. You know, that's a really good answer because I can I can see it. You know, Carolina blue, obviously. Yeah, most of my work. Yeah, a lot of well, not most of it, but a lot of my work has Carolina blue in it. That's my favorite color for sure. Oh yeah, and you can't do black people without the color brown. You know, right? <laughs> it's just like you're. Like, we have this new technique of <laughs> mixing colors to make black. It's like you can just use brown, bro. <laughs> yeah, just use brown, man. It's easy. <laughs> I mean, we come in different shades, but it's it's, it's brown at the root. Uh, yeah. So a little brown and a little black, a little brown, a little white. It's you got everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not paper bag tested now. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so that's pretty much it for the podcast. Um, and one, I, I want to thank you for coming on and making the time um to to be on this podcast. This has been a lot of fun chatting with you. And um, and two, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners where they can follow you, where they can check out your work, website, social media, all of that good stuff. The floor is yours. Yeah. So um, my Instagram is, 
is uh, Esteban.Whiteside. Um, my website is EstebanWhiteside.com. I got a, a print drop in on the 30th. So, you know, if you, uh, if you're in the market for a print, got that coming on the 30th. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's about it. I just want to tell you, you know, I really appreciate it. You're bringing me on here. It was, uh, it was a great conversation and, uh, Yeah, man. Thank you again. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Esteban Whiteside for coming on and sharing a bit of his story with us. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. (laughs) 